Hello, my name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. Welcome to Holy Week, the week where we focus our attention on the passion of Jesus Christ. Today, Pastor Ron is preaching on the triumphal entry in John chapter 12. From that point, we have put together a reading plan to journey throughout the rest of John's gospel throughout this Holy Week which will culminate with a Resurrection Sunday message from John chapter 20 next week on Easter Sunday. Specific details of that reading plan have been shared via email. If you have any questions or you did not receive that plan, please contact a member of the staff and we will gladly help you. Due to our focus for Holy Week, we will not be having any fireside chats or the virtual prayer meeting on Wednesday. Please check the website daily, though, as the staff is putting together a devotional that is specific to each day. So on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning, we will have a specific devotion for you relating to the chapter in John for that day. We look forward to the day where we can worship together here in this place. Until then, please remove any distractions so you can worship our great God. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. I'll be reading our call to worship and our scripture reading this morning. We are called into worship from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. This is our great aim, to come and to make a joyful noise, to praise you, to serve you with gladness. We are thankful, Lord, that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. We pray that you would be pleased with the worship that we give you, and we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through the end of the chapter. Matthew, chapter 11, starting in verse 25. Would you follow along with me? At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light." This has been the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are, again, a very thankful people. We thank you for what you have done for us, even as we have just read in your word that you have, you have revealed yourself, you have revealed your son and the salvation that he brings to us, not because of our own wisdom, not because of anything great in us, but you have done this because of your own love, and for your own name's sake, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us understanding and knowledge through your spirit, for without it, we would be lost. So we praise you this morning. We thank you for what you have done for us. Lord, we also come to you and we have many burdens on our hearts. Even as we have read this passage and we hear that you are willing to take our burdens, we have read this passage and seen that that Christ offers us his yoke, which is light, in place of ours, which is heavy. But the burdens of this life, the burdens of our world, do weigh down on us right now. We think of those that maybe we know or, or that we have heard of who are, who are sick. We think of them and we, we pray for them, Lord. We pray that you would bring healing. We pray that you would bring comfort to those who, who, are, to those who are afraid to those who don't know how to respond, and to those who don't have a hope in a future, Lord, we pray, we pray that you would bring salvation to them. 
Father, we thank you for your church, for the people of God, not only here in our local body, but around the world. Lord, we pray that at this time, that your word would go forth, that the missionaries that we support, that Christians around the world would be willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are around them. Lord, we know that you have promised to build your church, and you have promised that those from every tongue, tribe, and nation will worship you. And we trust that this pandemic has not changed your plans, that you are still in control, you are still sovereign, and so we pray that you would work even in the midst of suffering to bring about salvation, to bring about those who would praise your name. Lord, we pray that you would help us. We pray that you would help us to trust you each day, that we could trust you because you are good and you are faithful and you always care for your people, knowing what is best, even when we don't understand it. Lord, we thank you for this and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. I can't think of any place I'd rather be than with you. Even though it doesn't look like it normally does, we are here together, gathered around your word, wanting to hear from you. And I invite you to open your Bibles this morning on this Palm Sunday. Our text is going to be John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. Palm Sunday is an important event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so important that all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all include what we call Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that in itself is saying something about the importance of what happened on this day because as you study the gospels, there are very few events that are written about in all four of them. His death on the cross, his resurrection, the feeding of the 5,000. But not even Christ's birth is included in all four Gospels. And yet, Palm Sunday is. So Palm Sunday is obviously important, but why? What message is our Lord Jesus sending to us even as we sit in front of our computers or with our smartphones here in the 21st century as we're homebound during this coronavirus pandemic? John has a great eye for details. John's account identifies some details that help us understand the meaning of what is happening on this first Palm Sunday. There are observers and there are observers, and, and John is truly an observer. Some people can picture a scene, but once it's out of our eye shot, we've forgotten many of the details. But the Apostle John has a real eye for things that others of us might not notice. And he directs our attention to things that, as we look more closely, they help us understand what Jesus is doing and why he is doing what he is doing as our Lord enters Jerusalem in preparation for the cross and then his rising from the tomb. So I hope you have your Bible and we're reading it together. Let's read John 12, verse 12 through verse 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. 
you can remember the Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl victory parade from two years ago, try to picture that scene, but then transferring all the enthusiasm from a, a sprawling metropolitan area like Philadelphia and transfer that to a, to a contained, relatively small city, almost a, a big town, really, like Jerusalem. Pilgrims from all over Israel, indeed from all over the known world, would gather in Jerusalem three times each year. They would gather at Pentecost at the summer First Fruits Festival. They would gather at the Fall Harvest Festival of Tabernacles. And they would also come to Jerusalem for Passover in the spring. Tabernacles was probably the most joyous of the three festivals, while Passover, because of what it signified, was the most solemn, normally speaking, because of what it commemorated. When Jews gathered in Jerusalem for Passover, there was gratitude and there was celebration, but there was also the remembrance of the sacrificing of thousands of, pa of innocent Passover lambs, for it was, after all, the blood of those lambs placed on the doorposts of Hebrew homes that caused the death angel to pass over the homes of the Israelites. But now, as we read John's account, we don't see any restraint. We see not at all any solemnity. We see joyous, exuberant celebration. It's an Eagle Super Bowl victory parade kind of scene. Now, why is that? Because of the meaning that many who were there that day attached to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. So what I want us to do this morning is to look and talk about that meaning, about meaning in general. First of all, meaning that John's details give for us. We have the meaning first that the assembled crowds tried to give to this event. And then we have the meaning that Jesus himself gave to his entry into Jerusalem. So let's see John's eye for detail that helps us to keep this fresh. Many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, have heard a Palm Sunday service since we were children. We know many of the details, but it's John's eye for detail that helps us to be familiar, um, not just familiar, but, but fresh, to take a fresh look at what we're tempted to gloss over. Let us first look at the meaning that the crowds tried to give. If we don't read closely, we can look at this passage and we can think about the crowds that witnessed Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and we can just see it all as one large mass. But John tells us that there were multiple groups of people who were part of this procession. When John opens verse 12 by writing, the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast, he is talking, of course, about the Passover feast. To put this in the context of last week's sermon, this is the next day after the party had been thrown for Jesus where Mary took the expansive vial, the expensive vial of pure nard and she poured it over Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. It is the very next day. And while Passover is still a few days away, Jewish pilgrims are, are massing in Jerusalem, but they are not all of just one amorphous mass. John begins in our first verse, with one crowd of people who were already there for the Passover feast. And he says that they had heard that Jesus was approaching. So they're already in Jerusalem, but as Jesus proceeds from Bethany and as he comes over the Mount of Olives, they come out of the city, they come back out of the city, and they come toward him as he, he enters. They want to greet him as he enters the city. John then tells us that they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Now, we call this event Palm Sunday, but John is the only one of the four gospel writers who includes this specific detail that they took palm branches with them as they went out to meet the Lord. That, I think, is significant. They are sending a signal with what they are doing, but what is the signal? What is the message that they are sending? There is nothing in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, that connects palm branches with Passover. In fact, the 
only connection that palm branches, and we need to say that palm, date palms are everywhere in Israel, there's only one connection that palm branches have with one of the great feasts, but it is with the Feast of Tabernacles. Jews would wave palm branches in the fall as part of that great Thanksgiving harvest festival when they praised God for his provision for them. But there's no connection between palms and Passover, at least not in the Old Testament. So where do the palms come from? It's not a biblical thing or a theological thing. It was a nationalistic thing. For about 150 years before this day, when the Maccabees overthrew the Syrians, and they did away with the oppressive rule of a man named Antiochus Epiphanes who called himself God made manifest. He had the, the hubris to call himself God in the flesh. Well, it was then that palms came to be a symbol. It was a symbol of freedom. For when Simon the Maccabee drove the Syrians out of Jerusalem in 141 BC, he was praised with music and he was fated with the, the waving of palm branches. Now, later, uh, maybe less than 40 years after this day, uh, the Jews are going to revolt against the Romans before their uprising was crushed. The freedom fighters of that day, they struck coins. What was on the face of those coins? Palms. Palms were a shout of freedom from oppression. To quote uh, a Scottish pastor and theologian named Sinclair Ferguson, he said, palm branches in this culture and historically among these particular people and historically in Jerusalem, palm branches were national flags. Now combine what they were doing with what they were saying. They were crying out, John tells us, words from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is one of the great Hallel, or praise psalms, psalms sung by pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem for worship and for the feasts. So the crowds who came back out of Jerusalem to greet Jesus as he came in shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. That word Hosanna appears just once in the Old Testament. Psalm 118 Verse 25. In Hebrew, it's Hoshiana or Hosanna. But something happened since the first Hosanna was written or cried out in Psalm 118 as it's written, and that the time when the pilgrims coming to Jerusalem are, are saying what they're saying here. In Psalm 118, as it was originally written, verse 25 means Hosanna says, We need salvation. Lord, please save now. That's not what the crowds approaching Jerusalem on this day with their palm branches waving. That's not what they're saying. That's not what they meant. They're not asking God to send salvation. No, they're instead saying, salvation is here. Salvation has come. And they're connecting that with Jesus. They're connecting that with their understanding of what kind of king will come and what kind of salvation he will provide. They're looking for a rescuer. They're looking for a liberator. They're looking for a political champion. They're looking for a military messiah. Now there's something else that we need to remember and, and John has already told us about it. John has already told us in his gospel that Jesus is a marked man. We can see that in passages like John 11 verse 50 when Caiaphas the high priest determines that Jesus must die and he says it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He's saying it's better for the Jewish leaders, it's better for the religious establishment that one man should die instead of the people in an uprise, because if, if, if they don't stop this, if they don't quell this, if Jesus gains more and more popularity, the Romans will come in and will crush the whole nation. So their antagonism toward Jesus and their designs to kill him, it's not secret knowledge. It is well known. So as the pilgrims wave their palm branches and they shout their hosannas, they're anticipating, maybe they're even trying to spark a confrontation between Jesus and the authorities. They do what they do with the idea that 
what they're going to do is they're going to do their, their waving and their shouting, and then they're just going to sit back and see what happens. So we even get a hint of that in verse 19. When the Pharisees, as they're observing the crowds and the mass jubilation all surrounding Jesus, they say to one another, well, you see that you're, going, you're, you're getting nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Hint, we need to do something about this now. So we have one crowd coming out of Jerusalem with their nationalistic fervor. And we also see in John's account that there are others who are now, just now, coming into Jerusalem for Passover, Jewish pilgrims from all over. If you peek ahead at verse 20, you'll see a group of Greeks who come up to one of the disciples, Philip, and they ask him, sir, we, we wish to see Jesus. They, they single out Philip because he's from Bethsaida in Galilee, which suggests that that's where they're from, too. So this is another demographic in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, those who are just coming in to celebrate the Passover, and, and they're curious about Jesus. They've heard of him. They want to know more, perhaps even to meet him. Now John, though, in verse 17, tells us that there is also a third group. Besides the crowd that's already in Jerusalem and besides people who are, who are just now arriving in the city, there's a third crowd who have come with Jesus from Bethany. John says they are the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. And John says of them, they continued to bear witness. They're talking about that miracle with others who are part of the throng. In a sense, they're saying, D did you hear what Jesus did? I was there that day. I was there to comfort Mary and Martha, and I saw Jesus go to the tomb and say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. And as they talk, others gather because they had heard that he had done this sign and they wanted to see just who it is who had brought a dead man to life. Assemble all the details. What do you have? You have a powder keg. You have an assembly fraught with drama and high expectations and confrontation. It is at this point that the spotlight turns off of the crowds and turns to Jesus himself. For as John explains it and provides the details he gives us, it's Jesus who will give Palm Sunday its true meaning. The details that John gives will clear it up for us. And why does John give us the details that he does? Because, my friends, I believe that Palm Sunday is one of the most misunderstood events in the life and ministry of our Lord. John wants to clear away, then, the clouds of misunderstanding so we see what Jesus is really doing here. It's tempting to look at Palm Sunday with a tinge of sadness, and even many Christians tend to look at it that way, as if what's happening here in their minds is it's Jesus' last attempt to garner favor with the masses, to think that after all the many times that he had given strict instructions not to tell people that he is the Messiah, only now, here, in a last-ditch attempt to gain acceptance and knowing that his critics are plotting against him, it's only now that Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He embraces the palm wavers and the Hosanna shouters. Is that what this is? More closely and personally, is this how you look at Palm Sunday? If you do, I want us to see the meaning that Jesus gives to his entry into Jerusalem. So John's text turns the spotlight from the crowds to Jesus himself. But in the midst of John's eyewitness account, the, the apostle says something very curious in verse 16. He says, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. I find that very curious because John was there that day. It says something about the honesty of the apostle and the honesty of scripture, of course, that it's John, an eyewitness, who notes this detail. It's almost like if you had been standing on the, on the sidelines that day as, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and if you had said to John, John, you're one of his disciples, so tell me, what does this mean? 
on that day, John might have just shrugged his shoulders. Or perhaps more likely, he would have reacted just like the crowds, saying something like, isn't this great? Salvation has come. The king is coming to Jerusalem. When did the disciples finally come to the right understanding of the events of Palm Sunday? John tells us it was only when Jesus was glorified. Not when he went to the cross. Not when he rose from the dead. Not even during the six weeks that the disciples had with the risen Jesus with them. During that time, he explained much about what had happened and what would happen in the future. But it wasn't then that they got it. It's only after Jesus had returned to glory. It was only then that the Holy Spirit just grabbed their minds and provided illumination, and then suddenly they understood. Now, John is writing many years later. He's writing years after even the other Gospels have been completed and are circulating. The Holy Spirit has opened John's eyes, and now he understands. It's only after Jesus has ascended to glory that John and the others remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Perhaps you can imagine that one day the disciples as a group are still sitting together. They're talking about different prophecies regarding their Savior. And it's at that time that one of them who, who had memorized all or perhaps parts, good long parts of Zechariah, they, they did that in those days, certainly. It was only then that one of them recited what we know as Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. What we read here in verse 15. And you can just imagine as they're sitting around talking about the prophecies and their fulfillment, that suddenly they all look at each other and illuminated by the Spirit respond, Oh, that's why Jesus was, right, was riding the donkey on that day. Now remind yourself, you and I have the, the same Holy Spirit who takes even difficult passages of Scripture and opens our eyes to their true meaning. So let's look at how Jesus acted and how he understood what was happening. We read in verse 12 that Jesus, quote, was coming to Jerusalem. But it's only in verse 14 that Jesus, quote, found a young donkey and sat on it. He didn't ride from Bethany on that donkey. He walked. John says it's only when the palm wavers and Hosanna shouters went out to meet him that he stopped walking and that he sat on a young donkey that hadn't been ridden before. We know from the other gospel accounts that all this was pre-planned by our Lord, that Jesus had sent two of his disciples into a nearby village to fetch a donkey colt. And that means that our Lord anticipated the crowd reaction. And it also means that he planned everything that we see in terms of his response. None of this is accidental. There are no such things in the life of our Lord. So Jesus walked, and then he intentionally sat on the donkey. And John tells us that one of the reasons he did so was to fulfill what the prophet Zechariah had written 500 years earlier, what we see as Zechariah 9.9. Zechariah 9.9, if you were to take John 12 and what we read in verse 15, and you actually go back to the second last book in the Old Testament and you compare them, you'll see that it's not an exact quote. That's not unusual. For quite often when either Jesus, the apostles, or the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, they paraphrase or, or else they use snippets from more than one source and they compile them into one single statement. Here, John doesn't include all of Zechariah 9.9. He doesn't, for instance, I find this fascinating. He doesn't quote the part of that verse that says that the king, as he comes, would be righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey? Those things are certainly true of our Lord. Jesus is righteous. He never sinned, not even once. And he is the possessor. He alone is the possessor of salvation. Jesus and Jesus alone provides what we need, salvation from sin and salvation for eternity. Listen to Peter's words in Acts 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men 
by which we must be saved. So Jesus deliberately stops walking, and he sits on the donkey colt. Why does he do this? Well, to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy that was written about him, to show that he alone fits the prophetic description that Zechariah supplies. But it's much, much more than that. For in doing what he did, Jesus is sending a message about who he is and what he has come to do. A message that is our ultimate source of hope, provided we have the right kind of understanding of what kind of king King Jesus is. What is Jesus doing by this action? Two things. He is rejecting the view that the masses have of what kind of Messiah he is. And he is also intentionally bringing the opposition of the religious establishment to a head so that they will act as they acted. He's, in a sense, challenging them to act. Why? Because Jesus has come to Jerusalem to die. He has come to the city to go to the cross because what Caiaphas had said unwittingly needs to come true. One man must die for the many. One man must die taking others' sins upon himself so that the many can go free. So what's the importance of the donkey colt? The palm branches and shouts of Hosanna bring to our minds and to the minds of the crowd a, a white charger, uh, a, a war horse. For horses are the mounts of war. And donkeys? Well, they're royal animals too. Kings rode donkeys in Israel. There are connections between King David and his son Solomon and donkeys. Kings rode donkeys. When did they ride them? They rode them in times of peace. And that's the message that Jesus is sending here. For Jesus brings peace. He brings the most wonderful kind of peace. He brings the kind of peace that stills our fears and allows us to have peace in our souls, even in the most turbulent of times. It's interesting, I think, that none of the gospel accounts of Palm Sunday, not even John, quote the very next verse in Zechariah 9, that is verse 10. I'm wondering if John assumes that many of his initial readers when their eyes and minds and hearts are opened by the Holy Spirit's illumination, they already know what Zechariah wrote next. Listen to Zechariah 9, verse 10. It tells us that when God's king comes, God will declare, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. When Jesus entered Jerusalem as king, he showed himself to be a king like no other. He came not, not just to provoke a confrontation. Primarily, he came to bring peace and how would he bring the peace we need? By dying. When Jesus went to the cross, he brought peace where it's needed most. For he brought peace between a holy God and sinful men and women. Remember the words we sing at Christmas? God and sinners reconciled. That kind of peace. In Colossians 1, verse 20, the Apostle Paul will write that Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross. So Jesus, the Prince of Peace, has come to bring peace between us and God. We need that so much more than the Jewish people needed freedom from the Romans. So as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, an animal of peace, Jesus rejects the crowd's image of the Messiah. And five days later, the masses will reject him. But that didn't catch Jesus by surprise either, for he had come to go to the cross. And it was at the cross where he purchased peace for sinners like you and like me. The question we must ask in conclusion is this. Has he brought peace to you? There's precious little peace to be found in our world these days. Life looks so very different than it was just a few short weeks ago. Many have no peace of mind, heart, or soul. 
And many think that peace will only return when this coronavirus threat finally dissipates. But on this Palm Sunday, God's word has a message for us. It is a message of peace. It's a message that says that even if there were no virus, you wouldn't have peace. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ and know him as Savior and Lord, there is no peace for you. Ultimately, because you're still at war with God, a God who in his holiness hates sin and needs to punish it wherever he finds it. But on the other hand, if you have trusted in Jesus, you can know that he has taken your sins as far as the east is from the west. That is how far he has removed our sins from us. Your sins and my sins and the sins of all who have trusted in him, they went to the cross where he took our punishment upon himself. And we have peace. We have peace with God. We have been reconciled to him. And we can trust further in his promise that he will supply all the strength we need to get through this trial and this life. And even beyond that, we can trust in his promise that he has provided eternal life for us in and through Jesus Christ. We live in hard times. Hard times require hard faith. I need to know, even as I take every precaution I can to protect myself and my family in every way that I can, that even if the worst takes place, if suddenly I test positive for COVID-19 and I am ushered out of this life, I need to know, and so do you, that I am at peace with God because of what Jesus did in being my peace knowing that the Prince of Peace, the humble king who rode into Jerusalem on an animal of peace, knowing that he has saved me and provided for the forgiveness of my sins, I am at peace. May you know this peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the importance of this day. We thank you that in, in many ways this day pushes our minds forward to what is to come. And we can look forward with great anticipation to the sacrifice your son, our savior, made for sinners such as us. He went to the cross so that we ultimately can have peace with you. Oh, how precious, Lord, it is to be forgiven. We need that kind of peace. For that kind of peace can even allow us to go through the trials that we are experiencing with an inner peace. For we know that even in the worst case, we are at peace with you and eternal life is ours. So strengthen us, Lord, I pray. May we place our faith fully in you and in the Savior you have provided. Prepare us for Good Friday, for Easter Sunday, and may we rejoice even as we sit in our homes trying to stay safe. You've given us peace, and for that we are grateful. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen and amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm.